The following is a special presentation of TNN, Nashville Network. You know, ladies and gentlemen, at the age of 25, Jeff Gordon is the defending NASCAR champion. I was thinking about that, you know, when, when I was 25, uh, I still had a paper route. <laughs> All right, here now, in his uh, first TV special, he offers a behind-the-scenes look at his life, as well as some never-before-seen footage of Dale Earnhardt shoplifting a wrench at Sears. <laughs> Gentlemen, start your VCRs. It's Jeff Gordon, wide open. Is he old enough to have his own show yet? Jeff Gordon has his own show? Um, man, I just had lunch. <laughs> he's got his own show? Is he ready for that yet? You know, I... I Here's the thing. I don't know. The initial reaction was I almost threw up my baloney sandwich. <laughs> That's the name of the show, Wide Open? Wide open. I, don't, I don't think it would work. And I've kindly come to the conclusion that to get your own TV show, all you got to do is have never shaved in your life. Sorry, you know what I mean? I don't know if he knows that much. He's a kid. He's a kid. <laughs> what is it, kids? Is it a kid show? One of the ball, white flags, and what you got to do. They come in numbers that are staggering. Thousands and thousands from every walk of life to witness a special breed of heroes who put their lives on the line. Jeff Gordon is the greatest race driver to come along in a long time. And, and he doesn't know that. He won't admit it. And, and a lot of other people don't want to admit it. But anybody that's been around the sport, if you're a real racer, you obviously you can look at that kid and know. I was so impressed with Jeff Gordon that I was willing to start a new team with no sponsor and uh, just work and run it out of my pocket if I had to. Modern charioteers brandishing 700 horses on the most dangerous tracks in the world. Jeff has been making decisions and carried responsibility on his shoulder for the end result of the day since he was five years old. In the wake of perhaps the most meteoric rise in the history of motorsport, one young man emerges. And in the valiant tradition of previous dynasties, he remains unrelenting in his pursuits. He's such a genuine person, and, and I think that's what caught my eye about him so much when we first met. You know, I thought, here, this guy, 21 years old, you know, just won the first race, you know, in Winston Cup that he's been in. And, you know, just really on a roll, I, I thought, well, this guy's got to have a huge head, real cocky, you know, he's not going to be able to fit into the door. But he's so genuine and so down to earth that you really don't, you don't, it takes you by surprise. Here is the most popular spectator sport in America, engaging crowds whose numbers dwarf all those of other professional sports, attracting fierce, fanatical fans of courageous athletes who refuse to lose. I don't care how good your driver is, if you don't have a good pit crew, you're dead. You're not winning one of these things. I think the Rainbow Warriors brought a totally new look and image to uh, NASCAR. And um, all of a sudden, within a year, they were champions. In this arena, winning and losing is measured in tenths of seconds. There is no room for error. All players know this game is for keeps. I feel like I relate a lot of things with, with other professional athletes because I know there's a lot of dedication to, you know, be the best at, at what it is they do. I know that the things that I had to give up to go racing and I see that pretty much any professional athlete these days has to do those things that have to be dedicated and they have to give up a lot of a lot of things it has been said opportunity knocks but once I gotta figure out what I'm gonna say if I do win uh, and how I'm gonna feel if I don't <laughs> if that is true here is one who not only answered the call but leaves the door wide open Jeff embracing his sport with a relentless desire to succeed. I mean, I can remember saying that. I would just die if everybody in the grandstand booed my son. And you know what he said to me? He said, Mom, 
I hope someday, because I know how good Steve Kenzer is, and that's why he's getting booed. He's not getting booed because he's a loser. He's getting booed because he's a winner, and that's what I want to be saying. To me, he's the Michael Jordan of racing, and that's bad news for a lot of people who have got to race against him for a long time, because if he's going to keep getting better, they could be in big trouble. Jeff Gordon Wide Open, presented in part by Burger King, get your burgers worth, and by Sea-Doo, the best-selling boat in the world. People know the dramatic ebb and flow of living in the limelight of real celebrity. Jeff Gordon. The price is often great, and yet so are the rewards. With more opportunity comes more responsibility to friends, fans, family, and teammates. For Mr. and Mrs. Jeff Gordon, their home near Charlotte, North Carolina, often provides a welcome retreat. Well, guys, you know, it has been such a pleasure hanging out with you this past six months. I wish we could say the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I such a joy. Well, yeah. well, you, have been, you have been a fly on the wall. Yeah, I mean, half the time I never even knew that y'all ran an event that we ran. So much has happened in just so little time that's what's amazing to me what I can't get over and you feel like you know you just want to not want to wake up from a dream you know that you're living seems like. my life's kind of been like that I mean I never expected yeah. things to happen the way they have at four years of age Jeff Gordon was already speeding down the road of life racing BMX bicycles but his mom soon had reservations well you take a four-year-old that's really really small and you can take an eight-year-old kid that's really, really big, and there's a huge difference. And I just told John, I said, this is not what I want to see him do. So <laughs> John comes home, and here is two cars, <laughs> two little cars. One was black and one was pink. One was for Jeff, one was for our daughter, Kim. And I looked at him and I said, what in the world is this? He said, well, this is what we're going to do. You don't, you don't like the bicycle, so we're going to do this. And I said, we're going to put him in a car. Well, that's good. Soon, Jeff was in his own quarter midget, a miniature race car with open wheels and just over two horsepower. You can't actually race in events until you're five years old. Oh, I, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to be an old man to, to, to start. <laughs> so I started at the novice level and started when I was five. Jeff was quick to move from newcomer to the stock classification allowing no modifications to the motor. In his first years in quarter midgets, his greatest hurdle wasn't winning, but accepting the rewards. Come on. Come on, By his third season, eight-year-old Jeff Gordon was prevailing in almost every race he entered, and by this time was a bit more comfortable when he received his first Grand National Championship in Denver, Colorado. His early domination of the sport was without question related to the encouragement of his stepfather. I said, if you want to be a professional race car driver, then we're going to get up in the morning, we're going to act like one, we're going to dress like one, we're going to talk like one, and every moment of time that we spend, we're going to spend it focused on trying to be a professional race car driver. And if we're real lucky, somebody may think you're a professional race car driver. Maybe. And he was probably just five years old, but his first race, he wore a Simpson driving suit at his first race under the presence of let's be as professional as we can possibly be or just don't do it. In 1981, Jeff changed gears and began go-karting winning often at speedway karting events he entered throughout California, a total of 25 that year. He was still competing in quarter midgets and found the will to win another national championship in 1982. Jeff Gordon, the 15-year-old whiz kid for the United States of America. Victory was sweet, but winning had to remain challenging. To the surprise of some, sprint cars became his new obsession. 
Jeff was looking toward a new horizon. Now that is phenomenal. You got a 14 year old kid in a sprint car that weighs a thousand pounds with 700 horsepower on dirt tracks and he's got to sling that thing in there sideways. That is awesome. Jeff Gordon was now racing on several circuits in an assortment of cars. At 16 years of age, he was granted a USAC license and in the next four years, won 22 races, captured 21 poles, and earned 55 top five and 66 top 10 finishes in midget, sprint car, and champ dirt car competitions. On the night of his high school graduation, Jeff raced the King of the Outlaws at Steve Kinzer's hometown track, finishing remarkably in fourth place. If I hadn't started in a sprint car that had that much horsepower that was that big a step, I wouldn't be right here today at, at such a young age. It was, I, I think I just leaped over the rest of the people uh, from, from 12 years old to like 18 years old, because most people don't get started in sprint cars until they're at least in their early 20s or late, you know, like 18 or 19. And I mean, I leaped over those guys and, and, and it was such a big jump that, that it really paid off for me. After winning four dirt track championships in Indiana and Ohio in 1988, Jeff took the USAC Midget Rookie of the Year Award in 89 and the Midget National Championship in 1990 at age 19. The next year, he won the championship dirt car title, becoming the youngest Silver Crown winner in its history. His experience spoke for itself. Jeff has been making decisions and carried responsibility on his shoulder for the end result of the day since he was five years old. The more experience that you have in making decisions and carrying responsibility on your shoulder, the better you're going to be at it. And if you add to it a natural competitiveness, yeah, a good and humble heart, uh, a desire to succeed, a relentless desire to succeed that has developed inside him. He will not give up. He will not quit. The race isn't over until he has passed the checkered flag, no matter how many other people are coming to it. That's when the race is over. Now, you do that for 21 years, trying not to make the same mistake twice, you get pretty darn good at what you're doing. The difference between a guy that can drive a car that's perfect and a guy that can take a car that's a fifth place car and get it to first place or a tenth place car and get it to first place and most of the drivers you see out there can take a a car and they can maintain if they got the best car they might be the guy leading the race but uh jeff takes a car that's not a first place car a lot of times and he pits it in the winner circle because of his ability one thing was certain jeff gordon was at home in a race car. But when Jeff left the dirt tracks of open wheel racing for the pavement of stock cars, he could hardly contain his excitement. After a few spins around North Carolina Motor Speedway in Rockingham, he couldn't find a phone fast enough. I had never seen him that excited before. He just, he was, that was it. He knew right then, that's what I want to do for the rest of And those were his exact words. Yeah, he this, said, this is what I'm going to do, do for, the rest for the rest of my, of my life. life. <laughs> and he I'm said, like, this slow down. This is the greatest thing I've ever done. <laughs> yeah, just slow down a minute. I said, okay, fine. Yeah, he did. He called his dad that night, and, and, uh, and he just told him, this is what I'm going to do. Buck Baker's driving school had an impact not only on Jeff in those few hours, but also on Winston Cup history itself. Now living in Indiana, the kid from California was tempted to make one more big move from Indy cars to stock cars. This is it. Far as we can go. We can't, we don't have the money to take you where you need to go or where you hopefully want to be. Whether it be Indianapolis, whether it be stock cars, you know, whatever it is. We can't, this is it. So what we need to do is have a plan. We need to be prepared. We start going to some Indy car races, going to some stock car races, and just trying to figure out what the next step was. And I wanted more than anything to go to Indianapolis. Uh, that was, you know, anybody that races around Indiana or anywhere in the Midwest, that's, that's it, the Indianapolis 500. What wasn't crazy about the Indy car circuit itself is just Indy 500. And... I tried and tried and tried, and if I didn't have the big bucks, if I didn't have a big wallet, uh, I don't think I wasn't going to be able to make it. 
Jeff's decision was firm. At age 19, it was time to make the leap into stock cars and enter the Bush Grand National Series. 1991 was an incredible year. All day long on his radio to his crew. Not only did young Gordon win Rookie of the Year in the Bush Grand National Series, he simultaneously claimed the USAC Dirt Champ title. Not bad for a rookie. Yes. All right. All right. Yes. But the way he's bragged about this race car all day long on his radio to his crew, he just kept saying, good car, good car, good car. You can see some more of that going on right now. Yes. 195 complete. We've got trouble up in turn four. Three cars crashing into the wall. Four cars, traffic and damage. When I first met Jeff, I was uh, in New Jersey, and Andy Petrie calls me up and he says, I have a friend that's going to do a five-race bush deal with this young Gordon kid. Are you interested in helping him out? And I said, yeah, I'll come take a look at him, because I had seen him on Saturday Night Thunder driving the sprint car and the midget, and I thought, I'll go and see if this kid is for real. And he comes walking out. He's looked about 14 years old had half a mustache with eyebrow pencil that mixed into it his hair was long and in a flip and he's carrying a briefcase i'm carrying a briefcase and i said oh, how you doing you know nice to meet you he sits down i open up my briefcase and get out notes we're going to talk about things he opens up his briefcase he's got a stock car magazine a nintendo game boy and a cellular phone in his briefcase i thought to myself oh no what did i get into we were talking about a young driver to do some testing for us now, just started watching the Bush series, and uh, I asked someone, I said, who is, who's driving that, that car? And they said, that's that Gordon kid. I mean, I couldn't believe how the guy was driving his car so out of shape and loose, and uh, really impressed me. And I, my comments were, uh, it's a shame he's got a contract with Ford. And, uh, you know, it's almost like it was meant to be. We, we came back to Charlotte, I couldn't get it out of my, my head. How, how, how impressed I was with this Jeff Gordon. And his roommate worked for us, and we didn't know that. And his roommate happened to be walking through, and Jimmy made the comment, it's a shame that Jeff's got a contract. And he said, Jeff doesn't have a contract. So we immediately, like, you know, dogs on a bone. We were, <laughs> we were after Jeff and to, to talk to him and, and, and John, because I was that impressed with him. I've never been that impressed with a driver since I've been racing. I guess if, as parents, you're gonna hand off to somebody, I can't think of two better people than Rick Hendrick and uh, Ray Everham. I think that Ray is very, very organized. He's very focused on what he does. So I think that that's an absolute perfect individual to be his coach and to lead him. I think that Rick Hendrick is the type of individual that his family values, uh, the way he operates his company, the type of people, his understanding of business, his focus of the future. And I, I think that that's what uh, Jeff Gordon needs to be in that situation. He, he can't be with a person who looks down the road six months. He needs to be with a person who looks down the road ten years. And that, you know, it, there he is in the absolute perfect situation. When the 93 season started in Daytona, Jeff won his first race, making him the first rookie in 30 years to take one of Daytona's twin qualifying competitions. Driving against hot new rookies Bobby Labonte and Kenny Wallace, Gordon finished 14th in series points and was crowned Rookie of the Year. Then came 1994 Speed Weeks at Daytona Beach. Here he finished fourth in the Daytona 500 and added to his growing reputation in the pole winners only Bush Clash, followed by another victory, the Winston Open at Charlotte. Eight days later, he claimed his first ever NASCAR Winston Cup win in the longest race of the year, the emotionally charged Coca-Cola 600. The greatest day of my life. Arguably, however, the most fateful win in Jeff Gordon's career was just two days after his 23rd birthday. The inaugural Brickyard 400, that close to Pittsburgh, had to be an enormous thrill. Oh, it was unbelievable, Benny, and man, yes, this is every dream come true. Just to be able to go there, it didn't, didn't matter if I won it, just to be able to go and race there. And then we got there, and all these 
people from Indiana are cheering for me, and they're and now I'm like feeling some pressure. I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> now I got to win this thing, or they're gonna be mad. And uh, so, uh, so we went out there, and man, it was just a picture perfect day. They just, uh, you know, and, and when we came across that checkered flag, to see those grandstands, I mean, we're talking three or four hundred thousand people stand up, and every one of them cheering. And I mean, to tell you, it was it was emotional. It was exciting. It was. It was, I felt like I was in a fairy tale. I, I, I really thought I was dreaming I was going to wake up any second, but uh, they tell me it's still true. On the way to the Winston Cup Championship in 1995, Jeff seized seven wins, eight poles, and more than $4 million. With such record-breaking highs, he had accomplished an incredible feat, winning his first title before turning 30 years of age. Richard Petty was 27 when he claimed his first title in 1964. Dale Earnhardt was 29 in 1980. At age 24, Jeff Gordon was in good company. The day that Richard Petty retired in 1992, the day he ran his last Winston Cup race, Jeff Gordon ran his first. White flag for Jeff Gordon. I thought that was really neat that you know, out goes the king, and in comes, we didn't know at the time, but in comes maybe the new king. And 20 years from now, when Jeff Gordon retires, what are we going to do when Jeff Gordon retires? What will Rayson do? There'll be another young guy to step in and take his place, and in four or five years, he'll be the talk of Winston Cup Racing. Boy, the youth movement is alive and well in Winston Cup Racing. And Jeff Gordon going to victory lane. Jeff Gordon Wide Open, presented in part by Burger King, get your burgers worth, and by Sea-Doo, the best-selling boat in the world. No way, I got you, I'll beat me, kid. I'm gonna take the air off your sport. Well, I'll spin you out, then we'll have to go to the pits and fix the cars. Dad, can we please have our action monsters back now? this on Sunday. No, we're going to finish this after they go to bed tonight. Action racers and over-the-wall warriors are sold separately. Jeff Gordon Wide Open. Presented in part by sea -Doo, the best-selling boat in the world. And by Burger King. Get your burgers worth. A day in the life of a NASCAR Winston Cup champion is often unpredictable. Yet much is to be expected. Autographs, merchandising opportunities, and of course, the fans. The attention of the media is a given, as are sponsor appearances. Jeff Gordon's circle of friends and family keeps him balanced. His wife, Brooke, Ray Everingham, Rick Hendrick, and his Rainbow Warriors, business manager Bob Brennan, Hendrick GM, Jimmy Johnson. Marketing consultant, Hal Price. His parents, pastor, and fellow drivers. Of all of Jeff's relationships, his with Evernham is unique. Here is the only crew chief Jeff Gordon has ever had in NASCAR racing. When I think of, of Ray and Jeff together, I think of like a brother type situation. He's kind of like the big brother that Jeff never had. It's it's kind of a big brother, little brother thing. And and like I said, I, I can feel a lot of the things that he's going through. And our communication, I think, comes from respect. I believe in my heart when that kid gets in that car and drives it, he gets 100% out of it. There's no one else in the world that could make that car go any faster. He's the, obviously the best guy to drive that car. And I think he feels I'm the best guy to work with him setting it up. And that kind of mutual respect, it makes for a real good communication line. He's the only person that I know that, that gets the most out of every person involved, especially myself. Uh, he really knows how I tick and, and what makes me, you know, click. And I feel like I, I know what makes him click, too. And, and, you know, we work very well together. But uh, I feel like we're more than just crew chief and driver. Uh, I think because of the relationship that we have away from the racetrack, um, makes our relationship at the racetrack 
I respect him, and, and uh, you know, I feel like he respects me. Wow. And I was afraid that the rear wheels might spin. Uh, maybe their pit stop was a little bit slow. And that might have hurt him. I don't we know. We uh, are always focused, and, and I think he has helped me be more focused uh, about racing uh, and spend more time, you know, concentrating on, on my driving and, and what it's going to take to get the most out of him. He, you know, some days he's got to pump me up, some days he's got to calm me down. And sometimes I've got to do the same for him. So we have a great relationship. I think a little bit of it is magic. You know, everybody says, we've just, you know, once or in a lifetime, you get a combination that works. And, and together we can really set some records. And the whole team is that way. We beat with one heart and it's, uh, I, I can't give you an explanation why that is, but 90% of the time when he needs something, I know what it is, and I don't know if it's a, you know, a Radar O'Reilly deal or what, but we, you know, we, we just seem to click pretty good, and I, I don't think anybody can explain that. enjoys what they do more than the Gordons. They have assembled a talented, close-knit team. What a nut. I never thought I'd be in this position to be able to meet all these great people. Well, last year we watched the SBs on TV. Yeah. When it comes to having fun, there are plenty of opportunities. Be they backstage at an awards gala. What's going on, man? Hey, I was out there at the Super Bowl, man. You looked awesome. Or a casual celebrity gathering in a hotel lobby. We'll fit you in, and we'll, we'll get the car, and we'll take off. We'll have a little race, see how fast you, you really are. Yeah, I tell you what, now, I don't mind going 198 or 990 straight ahead. But when I got me turns, I, I got robbed. That's why I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, seeing other athletes and what they do to prepare themselves and what they do, whether it's during the off season or, or during the season, you know, and compared to what, what I do, because a lot of times people don't necessarily think race car drivers are athletes. The longer I'm in, in uh, auto racing, the more I realize it's exactly like football. Over there you have quarterbacks, over here you have drivers, over there you have coaches, over here you have crew chiefs. And uh, over there, you have 45 guys trying to make a team. Over here, we got 40 guys working on an NASCAR team. It is so much of a team sport because if you go into the shop, you see the preparation uh, of what those guys are doing to prepare each race car, then what that pit crew has to go through, the practice and the training, and then what they actually end up doing on race day. If, if they miss a beat, you know, the whole team misses a beat. If I miss a beat, the whole team misses a beat. You know, same for Ray. This is definitely a team sport. It takes everybody. Everybody's got to be together. You got to be good in every area. And uh, if you're not good in any of those areas, you're not winning in the NFL, and you're not winning in NASCAR. It's not enough to have a fast car anymore. Look at how many races are won or lost in the pits. You know, we, we've won some races because of our pit crew, you know, and, and in times past, we've lost some races because of not having proper pit crew. You, you've got to, this is a professional sports franchise just like anything else, and you've got to cover all the bases because when you get an opportunity to win, you've got to capitalize on it. You know, when you're hunting for tenths or hundredths of seconds on the racetrack with the race car, it's crazy to leave two or three seconds laying in the pits. So uh, I hired uh, an actual pit crew coach, Andy Papathanasiu, a nice Irish kid. And, <laughs> And uh, that, that's been his job, and he has done a tremendous job, and, and those guys are, are really athletes. You have various situations with, with crew members. Some crew members are your early guys that are going to leave Thursday evening late and, and fly for two or three hours and get to an airport and, and uh, rent a car and, and go to a hotel, and then they're back at 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning headed to the racetrack. And then you got other crew members that are staying back, and they're getting the cars ready for the next race. So you, you're, you're, you've got a lot of overlapping going on. But basically the crew members uh, are, are multi-trained. They're, they're fabricators, they are, are, are mechanics, they're painters, they're body men. Uh, and that's basically what you got. And then you got a crew chief that it's his responsibility to have a good shop foreman going in to make sure that things are done while he's away at the racetrack, things are being done at the race shop. Uh, I'm real big on Pat Riley. I think he's a real neat guy, and just got we we got a letter from him. Um, 
but his book in his book he had a checklist and we use it in our shop and it, it says from nobody to upstart so we got that first check and it said upstart to contender we got that one from contender to winner we got that one from winner to champion and we got that one and it says from champion to dynasty and that's the one that we're working on getting so when we win uh, you know i don't know four or five of these championships and we'll put that check mark up and his young bride live life to the fullest. Many would describe it as a storybook life. Some even call it NASCAR's version of Camelot. The prince of Winston Cup racing and former Miss Winston, his princess. Well, we met in Carolina The second run of the Sitting on the pole and ready to jam those gears. She was the new Miss NASCAR man. She was looking fine. And it was love at first sight at the finish line. You know, I just thought he was a nice guy, and he thought I was, you know, as a nice girl. And we were the same age, and we were like, maybe we can go have lunch, you know, sometime, just kind of like that. Too many miles. To not be thinking about the race But through the smoke and the oil and the car coming in I just see her face and I'll be trying to win this thing just one more time Win or lose, she'll be there at the finish line You feel like, you know, you just want to not want to wake up from a dream. Like every Sunday before, she watches for my number 24. Sometimes I think I'm driving her out of her mind. I certainly never thought and dreamed that any of this would happen. She knows it's in my blood. She knows I can't give it up. So she says another prayer Line. That faith helps me so much knowing that he's out there on the racetrack, you know, going at speeds as high as 200 miles per hour, you know, with 40 other cars out there at the same time. I mean, and, you know, and I get a little nervous and, and excited because I feel like that's part of my heart out there, you know, so, so special, you know, to me he is. And, and I just, and the only way I deal with it is with my faith with God. And it's the same way with Jeff. Well, if you look behind every winter, there's a good woman on the scene More important than the money or the points Our tires and gasoline I gotta say I'm a winner every time He's always had the idea that actions speak louder than words Long as I see you right there your actions on the track, your wins, your record speaks for themselves. Long as I see you right there in the finish line. He's not, I mean, I knew him for a whole year. We were engaged before I even knew that he had won other championships, you know, and stuff like that. He just doesn't talk about things like that. That's just his personality. I mean, still to this day, I really don't know what all he's achieved, you know, in his life. He never wants to give you that information because he's always had that perspective as the actions speak louder than words. This young man drives car number 24 for DuPont. And I'll tell you, Jeff picked up a lot of, of uh, yeah, you know who he is. fans from Promise Keepers. We're getting calls and letters from people all over me that said they weren't even a racing fan until they Gordon. saw him there. I knew there was going to be thousands of people there. Uh, they, they, they said, well, you know, you're going to, you might be getting up and actually talking to these people. And, and I'm like, 
okay, you know, do I need to, to get a, a plan? Do I need to write a speech? What do I need to do? And I'm the type of person that I don't write speeches. I don't, I don't, you know, plan ahead near enough. You know, I'm sort of new to this. Uh, I guess I, uh, I dedicated my life and I committed my life to Christ uh, about three or four years ago. Um, thank you, thank you. And finally, it came to my turn. I said, I'm just going to speak from my heart. I thank God a lot of times on television, but I, this is the first time I've ever given a testimony in front of a live audience, and it feels wonderful. Not only was it thousands of people that were there, but the people at home and everything, and I, I wanted to share my testimony, which I had never done really publicly, and especially not in front of a crowd like that before. And, and I wanted people to know just how, how much I felt for, for Jesus and, and what a difference it had made in my life and what a difference it can make in so many other people's lives. We have two great races here a year, and there's only one winner that comes out of that. Only one person gets to go to Victory Lane. But when you bring Christ in your life, everybody's a winner. I mean, if, if somebody knew me five, ten years ago, they'd so say, that, tonight, that's not Jeff, that's a clone, tonight, that's somebody else. All of you are winners. You're winners with God, and that's more important than anything. So thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Through Jesus Christ and getting to know God, I just feel like I lead such a better life, and I wanted to share that with everybody. He said that was the easiest speech I've ever made because he was talking from his heart, you know. And I think that really kind of tells you a lot about Jeff Gordon. Let's get to a little racing. The man in the middle of it, Jeff Gordon. Thanks for joining us live. Jeff, how is it to be out here on this big, huge racetrack for you? Well, it kind of reminds me of North Wilkesboro. Do you like the lay of the track so far? What, what do you see? It looks great. Now, this baby gets up to about 18 miles an hour. You think you can handle that, Jeff? I don't know. It might be a little more horsepower than I'm used to, but uh, I'm sure we can figure something out. For some, the celebrity spotlight is somewhat uncomfortable. But for Jeff Gordon, it's enjoyable and second nature. Public appearances have become a part of everyday life. You know, Mondays, I usually do interviews over the telephone, usually. Uh, a Tuesday, Wednesday, or a Thursday is, is a day I'm off on an appearance. Hi, I'm NASCAR Winston Cup champion Jeff Ford. Whether I'm racing on the speedway or boating on the waterway, I follow all the safety rules. I ride smart from the start. If I wanted to, that could take up every every day. I could do two or three, you. you know, okay, just about it. every other day. And it's a great opportunity for me to get to, to see, I got you know, you. what those fans are like, too. And I think that's a, a thing that NASCAR is, is big on, is that, you know, the fans are a very, very important part of, of, of this sport. And it's important for the for the drivers and the teams to be accessible to the fans. You know, I've, I've scratched my head a lot of times, kind of wondering, why are our fans... So loyal not only to the driver but to the sponsors involved I mean you can look at the demographics and, and the studies that are done and you can find that when a certain sponsor came into the sport their sales soared and that it stayed at a higher level and it's brand loyalty that relates back to our fan base when you can touch and feel and you can see these guys when they're not sitting in that race car as they're walking to and from grabbing something to eat uh, during the garage during practice or something like that and they stop and they autograph um, some item you have, or if they just say hi to you. Um, I think that means a lot, and I think the fans really relate to that, and they pick their favorite driver, and they stick with that favorite driver, no matter where he drives, no matter what type of car he drives. When you find a guy like Jeff Gordon that's good-looking, that speaks well, that likes to work with a sponsor, that likes people, and is one of the best talents that ever got behind a wheel, then you've got the whole, whole ball game right there. 
so very seldom do you ever have all of that in one. And he's that, that phenomenon that comes along that, uh, that, that he possesses all of that. You were. I think the neatest thing about the Make-A-Wish is, is that it's kids with all different types of, of diseases or, or problems that they might have. Some of them very serious, some of them not as serious. But uh, it's it's so important, I think, you know, to to get a smile on those kids' faces and and to see a smile on some of these kids' faces is very rare. And but yet you bring them around a racetrack, they they feel the atmosphere and the excitement. And they what happens is they get locked on to these these drivers and and they pull for them, you know each and every weekend and and it's their wish their dreams coming true all at once and i tell you what it, it really i know where it sits in my heart when i get to meet these kids and trust me it's it's the easiest thing that i can do and 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 the effort that it takes is nothing compared to what what it means you know to them he's a good person he's got all the talent in the world but he's good people He's got a good heart. How you doing, bud? He cares about people. Uh, he has a soft spot for children. There you go. Uh, Ray J is, he's uh, probably one of Jeff's best buddies. He was five years old, uh, July 18th, and uh, he's, uh, he's one of my heroes because he's, uh, he fought uh, a very tough battle. He was diagnosed with leukemia. That's what he got for his first birthday. Fought a very hard battle for about two and a half years. He's been uh, off of chemotherapy now for two years in complete remission, and he's doing really well. I think Ray J, you know, is a, such a special little kid. I mean, to see what all he's gone through and to see where he's at now today, if it weren't for just small support groups like what Ray and I have done with the Racing for a Reason and, and other groups around the country, you know, funding this program to try to cure leukemia, Ray J might not even be alive right now. We're proud to help Leukemia Research with this check for $5,021. It makes a difference. It, it does. Everybody thinks, well, you know, this dollar won't make a difference. Trust me, every little dollar counts. You know, when, when it first happened, he had a, you know, he had a 50-50 chance of, of living to be five years old. Uh, Right now, he's, he's moved up into the 90 percentile, so they're saying that, that he could be, you know, he, he could be great for the rest of his life, but you're scared to death every time that he gets a, a temperature or a cold or anything like that, so well, I can tell you nothing else is important. That, it, that helped me keep uh, this racing in perspective. You know, you go away from here with a wrecked race car or don't win a point championship or lose a race uh, because two ignition boxes fail or something, you know. You go home and that little boy's waiting up to see you and you realize, hey, this race and stuff, it, it's, it's just not that important. Presented in part by sea -Doo, the best-selling boat in the world. And by Burger King, get your burger's worth. You know, I, I really, honestly, I, I, and this is how, I, maybe I'm not a planner, maybe I don't look far enough ahead, but but if I win the championship, it's, it's a, a great, great, you know, achievement. Um, I'm not expecting to win it or to lose it. I, I'm just I'm just going to the next race and, and getting getting the best, you know, finish. And if those finishes add up to the finishes that we need to win the championship, then we've done our, our job for, for the year. I wouldn't count Jeff out at the end of the year. I mean I, I I never count him out, but I wouldn't count him out. He'll be there. It's you know our chances are good. I mean it's not pretend we we plan on doing it. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess when, hope when this airs or whatever, people are going, oh, what happened, hot shot? But bottom line is you got to believe, you know, we, you got to believe. We don't, we want to be the ones that come from behind and, and wail on everybody this year. You know, we're, we refuse to lose. We refuse not to have it. So, I mean, that's all I can say is, like, we're not putting up with any, you know, we just refuse not to get it. I think if he doesn't get hurt and he doesn't lose interest and burn out, 
Uh, he's got the potential to win more championships than anyone. Uh, a lot of people have said that, again, you know, anyone could have won a championship in his car. Well, I've been trying for 13 years, and that's the first one I've won, so, you know, so I think that it kind of answers that question. He's special. I mean, he's... Can any can anybody score 50 points a game? Sure they can, but not as often as Michael Jordan. You know, Jeff Gordon is the greatest race driver to come along in a long time, and, and he doesn't know that. He won't admit it, and, and a lot of other people don't want to admit it, but anybody that's been around the sport, if you're a real racer, you obviously, you can look at that kid and know. I know what we've got, and I know what I've seen him do with a race car, and you don't do that with a tremendous amount of talent. And, you know, he's the last one in the world. He's always saying, oh, I don't really, I'm not naturally talented. This is just all I've ever done, you know. He's naturally talented. He's, to me, he's the Michael Jordan of racing, and that's bad news for a lot of people who've got to race against him for a long time, because if he's going to keep getting better, they could be in big trouble.